Still another unopposed amphibious landing was made on the 20th of June at Lutong, the refinery centre for the Seria and Miri oil fields, 80 miles down the coast from Brunei Bay. The refineries were captured intact, along with stores of abandoned equipment. The uninterrupted advance along the west coast continued towards Seria, 26 miles southwest of Tutong. The Australians reached Seria on the 22nd of June and three days later took Miri, one of the oldest oil fields in Borneo. At Miri, 300 oil wells with a peacetime annual production of 1,318,000 barrels had been set afire by the Japanese and the 600 000 barrel storage tanks had been destroyed. Nevertheless, the capture of the northwest Borneo oil fields had been virtually completed and Dutch oil experts were soon at work exploiting the vast liquid wealth still underground. Beaufort, an important railroad junction approximately 60 miles northeast of Brunei Bay, was captured on the 27th of June with little trouble, and by the end of the month, Australian forces were pushing along the Jesselton Railway. The Australians now dominated 5,000 square miles of northwest Borneo, and their lines stretched along the coast for 135 miles. Except for patrolling and mopping up, the North Borneo campaign was over. The Brunei Bay operation had proceeded smoothly in both timing and execution. Nowhere on the mainland had the Japanese put up a concerted defence. The important oil fields of northwestern Borneo, strategic Brunei Bay, and the terminal of the northern narrow-gauge railway had been yielded by the enemy with only minor skirmishing. The Japanese on the west coast had shown little of the tenacity displayed on Tarakan, preferring instead to withdraw whenever possible. Rather than face the power of the Allied forces, many enemy troops had retreated from vital strategic areas to the mountainous interior, moving southward along the western coast of Kuching and into the area northeast of Brunei Bay. The third and most shattering blow in the reconquest of Borneo fell upon Balikpapan. Located roughly midway along Makassar Strait on Borneo's east coast, the Balikpapan area was one of the world's richest oil centres. When the Japanese attacked this great oil port at the beginning of 1942, the Dutch fired the storage tanks and blew up all installations in an attempt to prevent the exploitation of the oil fields by the enemy. Despite these efforts, the capture of Balikpapan had been a major and lucrative acquisition for the Japanese, whose well-prepared technicians and labourers had restored production facilities in record time. On the 26th of June, in the largest amphibious operation under General MacArthur's command since the landings at Lingayen Gulf, the ships of the Balikpapan attack group under Admiral Noble sailed out of Morotai. Three days later, the invasion force stood off the shores of Balikpapan to begin the most intense pre-landing naval barrage ever put down in the southwest Pacific area. More than 45,000 rounds of 5- and 6-inch shells were fired by cruisers and destroyers of the United States 7th Fleet and Australian and Dutch fleet elements. This terrific shelling had been preceded by 20 days of bombing by the Royal Australian Air Force and the US 5th and 13th Air Forces, averaging 200 tonnes of bombs a day. The Liberators hammered the oil port relentlessly, and effectively neutralised all enemy airfields within range of Balikpapan. Fifteen days prior to the landings, minesweepers were at work clearing the surrounding waters of the thousands of mines that had been laid successively by the Dutch, the Japanese and the Allies, as the course of the war changed with the years. On the 1st of July, the 18th and 21st Brigades of the Australian 7th Division charged ashore in the region of Klandasan. The 25th Brigade was held as a floating reserve to be employed according to operational developments. The communique for the 2nd of July announced the strategic implications of the landings. Australian ground forces have made a third major landing on the east coast of Borneo. Swiftly following our seizure of Brunei Bay on the northwestern coast and Tarakan on the northeastern, the enemy's key Borneo defences are now isolated or crushed, and his confused and disorganised forces are incapable of effective strategic action. The speed, surprise and shock of these three operations have secured domination of Borneo and driven a wedge south, splitting the East Indies.
Strategic Macassar Strait, the gateway to the Flores and Java Seas, is now controlled by our surface craft as well as by air and submarine. Development of already existing air facilities at Balik Papan will enable our aircraft of all categories to disrupt and smash enemy communications on land and sea from Timor to Sumatra. The whole extent of Java and the important ports of Soerabaya and Batavia are now within easy flight range and subject to interdiction. Our shipping can now sail with land-based air cover to any point in the southwest Pacific. It is fitting that the Australian 7th Division, which in July three years ago met and later turned back the tide of invasion of Australia on the historic Kokoda Trail, should this same month secure what was once perhaps the most lucrative strategic target in our East Indies sector and virtually complete our tactical control of the entire southwest Pacific. Landing at Clandesan Beach, two miles from Balik Papan, the Australians moved rapidly inland and within six hours had established a beachhead three miles in length. Aircraft and naval gunfire formed a barrage ahead of the advancing troops as the Japanese withdrew from the beach areas. Oil tanks became flaming infernos when supporting warships hurled shells into the Japanese defences. With the establishment of a strong beachhead at Balik Papan, the next day saw the Australian forces extend their lines and capture the important oil fields within a short distance from the beach. Within two days, the Japanese were cut off from their headquarters, with several thousand enemy troops in disarray. By the end of July, scarcely three months after the fighting had begun, every objective of the Borneo campaign had been attained. The swiftly moving 7th and 9th Divisions had thoroughly crushed the enemy. The Japanese defenders were completely defeated, and their beaten, sickly remnants were driven into the wooded hills of the interior to live off the land. The campaign had netted two great naval bases, Brunei Bay and Balik Papan, seven important airfields, the rich Seria Miri oil wells, the refineries at Lutong, and huge stores of Japanese equipment. Enemy garrisons remaining in the Celebes, Ba, Java, Sumatra, Malaya and Indochina areas were further isolated from their empire, with no future but surrender or eventual destruction at the hands of Allied mop-up forces. Just before the Japanese capitulation, the total enemy casualties in the Borneo operations were given at 5,693 dead and 536 prisoners. Allied casualties, in sharp contrast, were 436 killed, 3 missing, and 1,460 wounded. General MacArthur's successful bypassing tactics along the New Guinea coast, followed by his invasion of the Philippines, had left thousands of Japanese contained in the various islands of the southwest Pacific. At the end of 1944, there were over 110,000 enemy troops scattered in the Solomons, New Britain, New Ireland, and in eastern and western New Guinea. The urgent need for the veteran soldiers of the 6th Army to invade Leyte left to the Australians the task of finishing operations in these bypassed zones of enemy-occupied territory. General MacArthur proposed to continue the neutralisation of the pocketed enemy forces, but the tactical methods for accomplishing this mission were left entirely to the discretion of the Australian commanders. Australian First Army troops replaced United States forces in November and December 1944 and took over full responsibility for operations in New Guinea, New Britain and Bougainville. The fighting in all three of these areas followed the same general and unvarying pattern. Small enemy garrisons, cut off from supplies or reinforcements, and clinging desperately to their defensive positions, had to be painstakingly and methodically eliminated. Activity in the Wewak Aitape area during the first two months after the Australians assumed responsibility consisted mainly of energetic patrol actions against harassing parties of Japanese. Later, as the Australians began their drive from Aitape, some enemy forces retreated across the rugged Torricelli mountain range, while other units withdrew to Wewak. By late December, troops of the Australian 6th Division had advanced 34 miles along the coast toward Wewak and had pushed 40 miles inland beyond the Torricelli Mountains. In mid-March 1945, a coastal drive eastward resulted in the capture of the Butt and Dagua airfields. A month later, 
the coastwise advance had reached a point within 20 miles of Wewak. Meanwhile, the inland offensive encountered determined resistance as the Australians approached the heavily defended Maprik area. A general attack against Vevak was launched on the 10th of May. Supported by tanks, artillery and air and naval bombardment, the Australians drove westward against the Japanese 18th Army's last main positions on the shore of eastern New Guinea. An amphibious landing on the east coast of Cape Moem cut the enemy's coastal escape route and menaced Vevak from the east. After fierce fighting, the Vevak Peninsula was wrested from the Japanese on the 11th of May. The whole Waywak coastal area was then cleared when the eastward and westward drives joined on the 23rd of May. Except for a pocket remaining at Mafflin Bay, the New Guinea coastline was free of enemy resistance as far west as Gilvink Bay. New Britain was returned to Australian control early in November 1944. Bypassing positions seized earlier in the war, Troops of the Australian 5th Division landed first at Jacquineau Bay on the south coast of the island, placing themselves only 100 miles from the Japanese stronghold at Rabool. Later, they made another landing across the island at Wide Bay, which cut this distance in half. The Royal Australian Navy and Air Force supported the operations. Drives along the north and south coasts forced the Japanese into the mouth of the narrow Gazelle Peninsula, and bitter fighting ousted them from their strong positions in the open bay area by April 1945. Although the Australians carried out vigorous patrolling and fought occasional skirmishes with the enemy, their activity was generally limited after May. The remaining Japanese forces were effectively confined within the limits of the Gazelle Peninsula. A campaign to destroy the Japanese 8th Area Army's heavily garrisoned bastion at Rabol was made unnecessary by Japan's capitulation and surrender. Such an operation would undoubtedly have proved bitter and costly. Post-war investigation disclosed that the high ground around Rabol was honeycombed with strong underground defences, heavily stocked with ammunition and explosives. Most of Bougainville and all of Buka Island to the north were still under the control of the Japanese 17th Army, when the Australians took over the defensive perimeter at Empress Augusta Bay in November 1944. After relieving United States forces, Australian First Army troops expanded the perimeter considerably and began a gradual elimination of enemy units on the island. They moved along the western coast and across the island toward Numa Numa, the main enemy base on the east side of the island. Stubborn resistance was encountered in all sectors, particularly in the central areas where the Japanese lines of communication to the north were seriously threatened. In their drive northward toward Buka Passage, the Australians were faced by a well-entrenched enemy at Simba Ridge in the northwest part of the island. In February, heavy artillery barrages and fierce bombing and strafing attacks by Australian and New Zealand airmen were instituted to dislodge the Japanese from their positions. During the same month, the Motupena Peninsula in the southwestern part of the island was completely occupied against light opposition. To speed the northward advance, Australian units made two landings in March on the Sorokan Peninsula in the northwestern sector. A drive across the peninsula to the east coast compressed the Japanese into the northern tip of the island and effectively severed their lines of communication. The Sorokan Peninsula was cleared of the enemy by May as the Australians moved northward toward Buka Passage. The advance to the east coast in the central part of the island reached Numa Numa. In the south, meanwhile, the thrust toward Buin progressed slowly against bitter opposition. During June, successive enemy pockets of resistance were steadily eliminated. To the north, active patrolling was carried out as small bands of raiding Japanese were annihilated. In the central and southern sectors, the Australians increased pressure on the strong enemy positions emplaced along the Mebo River. The situation remained generally static thereafter, with the defenders being gradually compressed to the south and east along the coastal sectors and north to Buka Island until the surrender. The final mop-up of the northeast New Guinea, New Britain and Bougainville areas, which were spread over 1,000 miles of land and water, had been a tedious task. At the end of July 1945, General MacArthur's headquarters in Manila 
announced that a total of 12,385 Japanese had been killed on these islands since the first of the year. Pending the termination of the European conflict, for which the amphibious invasion of Japan waited, consideration was given to other possible operations that would require relatively small resources and would not interfere with preparations for the main effort. A large-scale offensive by United States forces on the Asiatic continent was deemed impractical because of difficult terrain, inadequate communications and strong Japanese ground force opposition. The China coast, however, had objectives suitable for limited operations subsequent to the conquest of the Ryukyus. Seizure of positions below Shanghai would tighten the blockade of Japan from the south, while occupation of areas north of Shanghai would cut Japanese lines of communication to Korea and Manchuria across the Sea of Japan and the Yellow Sea. The Shantung Peninsula, the Shanghai area, the Ningpo Peninsula and the Korean archipelago, all within range of Tokyo, offered favourable bases for the intensification of aerial bombardment. Certain operations in the North Pacific could be undertaken simultaneously. Existing schedules called for the defeat of Japan without the assistance of the Soviet Union. The possible use of United States and Russian heavy bombers and long-range fighters from bases in Siberia and the maritime provinces was strategically desirable but not considered essential at any time. During late 1944, tentative plans were made for securing a water route through the Sea of Okhotsk to Russian ports once the Russian entry into the war against Japan became imminent. These plans were dropped, however, because necessary resources were not available, and also because such a manoeuvre might have precipitated the premature entry of the Soviet Union into the Pacific War. The Soviet Union was not disposed to enter the war until after the defeat of Germany. The most advantageous time, from the Russian point of view, would be after United States forces made their initial lodgment in Kyushu, drawing Japanese troops from Manchuria. Conversely, the most favourable time from the American standpoint would be three or four months after the surrender of Germany and about three months prior to the invasion of Kyushu. This correlated timing would have ensured that the Soviet Union had sufficient strength to eliminate the possibility of a successful Japanese counterattack, which might disrupt the Russian advance or necessitate aid from the United States. At the same time, it would prevent the displacement of hostile troops from Manchuria, Korea and North China to Japan's home islands. Toward the end of 1944 and in early 1945, the question of Russian intervention in the Hull Pacific appeared occasionally in international discussions. The political, economic and military effect of such intervention seemed to have become a vital factor in the hitherto secret understandings. From the viewpoint of GHQ, AFPAC, any intervention during 1945 was not required. The substance of Japan had been gutted. The best of its army and navy had been defeated. The Japanese homeland was at the mercy of air raids and invasion. Although General MacArthur in 1944 had urged Russian participation to draw the Japanese away from the South Pacific and Southeast Asia, by 1945 such intervention had become superfluous. In February 1945, the combined chiefs of staff favoured an invasion of Kyushu Honshu in late 1945 or early 1946, following the defeat of Germany. The date of Germany's capitulation was estimated at the earliest as July 1945 and at the latest as the 31st of December 1945. It was also estimated that Japan would be defeated 18 months after Germany. Additional positions to further the blockade and air bombardment of Japan would be seized following the Okinawa operation and prior to the invasion of Kyushu. The air bombardment of Japan would then be intensified, thereby further reducing Japan's major military forces and creating a situation favourable to the direct invasion of the industrial heart of Japan via the Tokyo Plain. General MacArthur considered that an invasion of Kyushu was undoubtedly the most advantageous operation to undertake in the year 1945. He was convinced that any movement or allocation of resources that did not directly contribute toward this goal should be eliminated. He felt that the full power of the combined resources, ground, naval and air, in the Pacific was sufficient to initiate such an operation by November 1945, 
regardless of the status of redeployment from Europe and without consideration of Russia's entry or non-entry into the Pacific War. The real crux of the problem was the supply situation, but General MacArthur thought this could be solved if, as sole commander, he were given a high degree of operational authority to reorganise all army supply agencies in the Pacific. To provide the required allotment of service troops for the invasion of Kyushu, there would have to be a ruthless thinning of rear areas and a comprehensive pooling of army and navy resources. It would be necessary for the Navy to assist in moving forward service troops, equipment and supplies from New Guinea and the South Pacific. The War Department would have to allocate additional shipping for the amphibious movement and for the direct resupply to Kyushu. The issuance of a Joint Chiefs of Staff Directive on the 25th of May clarified the command organisation for the operations against the main island of Japan and set the date for the Olympic invasion of Kyushu at the 1st of November 1945. This target date allowed about five months for the preparation of the ground and amphibious forces and for the completion of the necessary logistic arrangements. The first step taken was a reorganisation of the Army Command. General MacArthur assumed the responsibility for the Japanese campaign as Commander-in-Chief of the newly constituted United States Army Forces in the Pacific, rather than as Commander-in-Chief of the Southwest Pacific Area, the capacity in which he had directed all previous operations. The duties and responsibilities of the two positions were quite different. As Southwest Pacific Area Commander, General MacArthur had exercised operational but not administrative control over ground, air and naval forces of the United States, Australia and the Netherlands East Indies. Simultaneously, as Commanding General of the United States Army Forces in the Far East, he was the Administrative Commander of the 6th and 8th Armies, the Far East Air Force and the United States Army Services of Supply, all of which comprised the major American elements in the Southwest Pacific. As Commander-in-Chief of the United States Army Forces in the Pacific, General MacArthur's responsibilities were expanded to include both operational and administrative control over all United States forces in the Pacific, except the 20th Air Force and certain troops in Alaska and the Southeast Pacific area. The need for a separate administrative headquarters was ended. The organisation of the United States Army Forces in the Far East was discontinued, except as a nominal agency to permit the approval of certain financial expenditures in the Philippines, as required by law. The United States Army Forces in the Western Pacific, AFWESPAC, a command subordinate to AFPAC, was created at Manila on 1 June 1945 under the command of Lieutenant General Wilhelm D. Steyer. This command was designated to take over the functions of the United States Army Forces Service of Supply and some of the functions of the deactivated USAFE. AFWISPAC would control all American Army Forces within the Southwest Pacific area except major combat commands. It would also be responsible for the logistical support of operations, except for Air Corps technical supplies. A similar organisation, the United States Army Forces in the Middle Pacific, AF mid -Pack, was established on the 1st of July under Lieutenant General Robert C. Richardson, Jr. This command was formed to take over the forces and installations of the United States Army Forces of the Pacific Ocean Areas and the Hawaiian Department as they were released from the operational control of Admiral Nimitz. Okinawa, strategically the most important island of the Ryukyus, had been invaded by the 10th Army's 24 Corps and the Marine 3 Amphibious Corps on April 1945. After some of the heaviest fighting of the Pacific War, in which severe losses in men and ships were suffered by both sides, the campaign was declared officially closed on the 21st of June, except for mopping up disorganised enemy remnants. With the capture of Okinawa, the Allies had acquired new airfields from which almost any type of plane could operate against targets in Japan's home islands. Okinawa also provided several excellent anchorages within 350 miles of southern Kyushu. Japan had lost the last outer fortress protecting her communication lines to Korea, the Chinese mainland, and to the Indochina and Singapore areas. Formosa was cut off and left helpless against Allied air and sea attacks. On the 19th of July, 
Admiral Nimitz was directed to transfer to General MacArthur by the 1st of August control of the American-held areas in the Ryukyus and all army forces there, including the 10th Army. At that time, General MacArthur would assume responsibility for the defence of these areas and for the logistical support of the strategic air forces based there. Admiral Nimitz would retain command of naval forces, installations and bases. By these reorganisations, General MacArthur was finally given operational as well as administrative control of all army resources in the Pacific, with the exception of General Richardson's AF Midpack and certain other garrison and service troops in the islands of the Pacific Ocean areas. On the 28th of July, General MacArthur attempted to secure operational responsibility for these forces as well, so that all army forces in the Pacific would be under one commander. He again recommended that the area boundaries in the Pacific be abolished because they had long ceased to serve any useful purpose, were patently artificial, and complicated the proper strategic and tactical handling of the United States forces in that theatre of operations. He pointed out that the existing demarcations prevented the unification of command within each of the services, and thus were contrary to the operational principles of the theatre. General Richardson, however, continued to function under dual control until the end of the war, with responsibilities to the commanders-in-chief of both services. The final disposition of the Southwest Pacific area presented another problem that had to be resolved before General MacArthur could concentrate upon his responsibilities as Commander-in-Chief of the United States Army Forces in the Pacific. He had recommended on the 25th of February 1945 that the Southwest Pacific area be dissolved with the completion of the Australian operations in the Netherlands East Indies. The consolidation of liberated territories and the conduct of civil affairs could then be transferred to British and Dutch authorities to permit the concentration of American resources for the invasion of Japan. On the 27th of June, General MacArthur again recommended that the areas south of the Philippines be removed from United States control, turned over to the British, and handled by them in coordination with the Dutch. As an initial step, all ground, naval and air forces other than United States forces would be released and transferred to the commanders designated. Thereafter, ports, airfields and bases would be released progressively as their use by United States forces was terminated. Negotiations with the British for this purpose were opened in April. The British at first were reluctant to put an additional burden upon the Southeast Asia Command until after the 1st of January 1946. It was expected that Admiral Mountbatten by that time would have completed the recapture of Singapore. The British were also uncertain of the extent to which they could absorb the great numbers of men and ships and the vast quantities of materiel which would be transferred when the withdrawal of United States control in this area was effected. The Americans believed, however, that Australian and Dutch units could garrison the Netherlands East Indies without affecting Admiral Mountbatten's planned operations. The final decision was made at the Potsdam Conference. The Southeast Asia Command was enlarged to include Borneo and the Celebes, and Admiral Mountbatten was directed to assume control as soon as practicable after the 15th of August. The Southwest Pacific area was continued as an Allied command under General MacArthur, but its operations were limited to minor rear area activities. As the date for the transfer of responsibilities approached, General MacArthur dispatched messages to the governments of Australia, New Zealand and the Netherlands in tribute to the Allied troops who had fought under him in the arduous campaigns of the Southwest Pacific. To the Australian soldiers, sailors and airmen, he wrote, Since the 18th of April 1942, it has been my honour to command you in one of the most bitter struggles of recorded military history, a struggle against not only a fanatical enemy under the stimulus of early victory, but the no less serious odds of surmounting impenetrable barriers of nature, a struggle which saw our cause at its lowest ebb as the enemy hordes plunged forward with almost irresistible force to the very threshold of your homeland. There you took your stand, and with your allies turned the enemy advance at the Owen Stanley and at Milne Bay in the fall of 1942, thus denying him access to Australia and otherwise shifting the tide of battle in our favour. 
Thereafter, at Gona, Wau, Salamaua, Lai, Finshafen, the Huan Peninsula, Madang, Alexishafen, Vevak, Torokan, Brunei Bay, and Balikpapan, your irresistible and remorseless attack continued. Your airmen ranged the once enemy-controlled skies and secured complete mastery over all who dared accept your challenge. Your sailors boldly engaged the enemy wherever and whenever in contact, in contemptuous disregard of odds, and with no thought but to close in battle so long as your ships remained afloat. There, your glorious accomplishments filled me with pride as your commander, honoured for all time your flag, your people, and your race, and contributed immeasurably to the advancement of the sacred cause for which we fought. I shall shortly relinquish this command which, throughout its tenure, you have so loyally and gallantly supported. I shall do so with a full heart of admiration for your accomplishments and of deep affection born of our long comradeship in arms. To you of all ranks I bid farewell. When the United States Eighth Army assumed the task of cleaning out remnants of the Japanese defenders in the Philippines, General Kruger's Sixth Army was released to prepare for the invasion of Kyushu. During a two-year period, the Sixth Army had conducted 12 major operations, involving 22 separate amphibious landings, and had advanced a cumulative distance of approximately 3,000 miles. Many of its units were under strength as a result of battle losses and the readjustment of high-point personnel. To remedy these shortages, veteran troops from the European theatre were to be obtained as replacements. Before the war ended in Europe, plans had been made for a partial demobilisation of the army immediately following the defeat of Germany. On the 6th of April 1945, General Marshall urged all theatre commanders to plan for the movement of the maximum number of troops likely to be eligible for discharge to the United States immediately upon the termination of the war in Europe. After the German capitulation, it was estimated that two million men would be discharged during the ensuing year. Approximately 300,000 of these would be drawn from the Pacific Theatre. Under the initial adjusted service rating score of 85, the 6th Army, which was being prepared for the invasion of Kyushu, would lose 23,000 enlisted men. In addition, there were 20,712 officers in the theatre, with 85 points or more who were eligible for discharge, even though there was already an acute shortage of officers for combat units. To correct this situation, plans were made to ship 10,000 selected enlisted men and 4,500 officers directly from Europe to the Pacific Theatre in September. General MacArthur and his staff were opposed to a further lowering of points prior to the invasion of Kyushu, as this would release veteran non-commissioned officers and specialists, endangering projected operations. There was not sufficient time to replace personnel of invasion units who had critical scores slightly below 85, nor time to train replacements if they were furnished. Recognising the urgency of the situation, the War Department agreed to retain the 85 score temporarily to meet operational requirements in the Pacific. The Southwest Pacific area had been continuously handicapped by a shortage of personnel during most of the war. Only after Germany's defeat could sufficient forces and shipping be accumulated to make the final effort against Japan. When General MacArthur became Commander in Chief, AFPAC, on April 6, 1945, the combined forces under his new command consisted of one airborne division, one cavalry division, 19 infantry divisions, and approximately 53 airgroups. Proposed redeployment would build this strength to five armoured divisions, one airborne division, one cavalry division, 29 infantry divisions, and 125 airgroups, plus 17 squadrons. The total forces of the Pacific area would be increased from approximately 1,400,000 army troops as of June 30, 1945, to 2,439,400 as of December 31, 1945. Securing qualified replacements was a task that required careful planning and close coordination with the War Department. The situation became particularly difficult for the Southwest Pacific area in February 1945. Many units were under strength, and there were cases where combat casualties and battle fatigue had whittled rifle companies down to only 30 men. 
The effective combat strength of the theatre had been so reduced that General MacArthur even considered inactivating a division and using its personnel as replacements. The situation was relieved considerably in the spring of 1945. The reorganisation of the Army Command in the Pacific and the approaching end of the war in Europe permitted an increased flow of replacements. In May, the understrength was reduced to 4,971 by the arrival of 46,420 new men. At the end of the following month, the theatre had gained 23,029 overstrength. In early August 1945, 5,000 troops passed through the Panama Canal on their way from Europe to Pacific assignments. The advance echelon of the First Army's headquarters arrived in the Philippines on August 7th. The 7th and 68th Corps were scheduled to arrive by October 15th, and six infantry divisions were slated to arrive in the Philippines during September, October and November. The tremendous forces and supplies necessary to execute the greatest amphibious invasion in history were being moved rapidly into position. Evolution of Downfall While the war was being fought in the Philippines and Okinawa, plans were rapidly developing for the largest amphibious operation in the history of warfare. Downfall, the grand plan for the invasion of Japan, contemplated a gargantuan blow against the islands of Kyushu and Honshu, using the entire available combined resources of the Army, Navy and Air Forces. The plans for downfall were first developed early in 1945 by the combined Chiefs of Staff at the Argonaut Conference held on the tiny island of Malta in the Mediterranean. On February 9th, just a few days before the historic three-power meeting at Yalta, President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill were informed of the conclusions reached at Argonaut. At that time, the strategic concept of future operations in the Pacific embodied the defeat of Japan within 18 months after Germany's surrender and included the following series of proposed objectives. 1. Following the Okinawa operation, seize additional positions to intensify the blockade and air bombardment of Japan to create a situation favourable to an assault on Kyushu to further reduce Japanese capabilities by containing and destroying major enemy forces and intensifying the blockade and air bombardment to establish a tactical condition favourable to the decisive invasion of the industrial heart of Japan through the Tokyo Plain. On March 29th, the US Joint Chiefs of Staff, working on the assumption that the war in Europe would be over by July 1st, 1945, and that the forthcoming Okinawa operation would be concluded by mid-August 1945, set a tentative schedule for the invasion of Japan. The invasion plan was assigned the cover name Downfall, and consisted of two main operations. Olympic, the preliminary assault on the southern island of Kyushu, which was slated for December 1st, 1945, and Coronet, the subsequent landing on Honshu, which was scheduled for March 1st, 1946. It was proposed that forces already in the Pacific be used to the fullest extent possible in planning for the assault and follow-up phases of Olympic. Reserve and follow-up divisions for Coronet would be obtained by redeployment, either directly or via the United States, of troops and equipment from the European theatre. On April 3, 1945, the Joint Chiefs of Staff issued a directive in which General MacArthur was instructed to complete the necessary operations in Luzon and the rest of the Philippines, prepare for the occupation of North Borneo, and make plans and preparations for the campaign in Japan. The amphibious and aerial phases of the projected homeland invasion were to be formulated in cooperation with Admiral Nimitz and General Arnold. Strategies under consideration as was to be expected in the consideration of an assault of such magnitude, there were numerous and varying opinions as to the best strategy to follow in developing the final plans. These different opinions flowed into two main channels of thought. On the one hand, it was felt that much more preparation was needed than would be possible under the tentative target dates of December 1st and March 1st for the Kyushu and the Honshu operations. To reduce the risks inherent in any assault on the well-fortified and strongly garrisoned islands of Japan, a preliminary and far-reaching campaign of air-sea blockade and bombardment was advocated. To implement such a concept, 
prior operations along the China coast at Chosan and Shantung, in Korea, and in the Tsushima Strait area were envisaged. Such a strategy, it was held, though admittedly more prolonged than a direct assault, would minimise the number of casualties, further reduce hostile air potential, and cut off reinforcements from Asia to Japan. Furthermore, it was conceivable that such a programme could force Japan's surrender without the necessity of a major landing on the home islands. The other school of thought believed in driving directly to the heart of Japan as soon as the necessary forces could be mounted from the Philippines and land-based planes could be established in the Ryukyus. The proponents of this strategy contended that Japanese air and sea power was already a relatively minor factor and that by the end of 1945 it would be weakened sufficiently to permit a successful invasion. Any sizable reinforcement to Japan from China or Manchuria could be effectively interdicted by the powerful ships and planes of the US fleet and by airstrikes from Okinawa. In addition, the enemy's shipping potential had declined to a level that did not permit material strengthening of forces in Japan by transport from the Asiatic coast. By December, the combined efforts of B-29S and carrier planes would have devastated large areas in Japan to soften the landing sectors and prohibit the rapid manoeuvre of major Japanese forces. From a broad perspective, it was argued that immediate invasion was considered to be the quickest way to assure the end of the war. In reply to a query from General Marshall requesting his opinion on the problem, General MacArthur pictured the future strategy in the Western Pacific as presenting three principal courses of action. 1. The Allies could encircle Japan by further Allied expansion to the westward, deploying maximum air power preparatory to attacks on either Kyushu or Honshu in succession, or on Honshu only. 2. A second course would be to isolate Japan completely by seizing bases to the west and endeavouring to bomb her into submission without actually landing in force on the homeland beaches. 3. The third course open was to attack Kyushu directly and install air forces to cover a decisive assault against the principal island of Honshu. General MacArthur analysed the relative merits of each of the choices offered. The first course, he felt, provided greater air power and a high degree of pre-assault neutralisation, in addition to achieving the eventual isolation of Japan, but it had the great disadvantage of deploying the bulk of available resources off the main axis of advance. Such a course would fail to increase short-range air coverage of vital portions of the Japanese islands, and, by spreading Allied strength in the Pacific over a wide area, would prevent an attack on the Japanese mainland, until after redeployment from Europe could be accomplished. General MacArthur also expressed the fear that United States forces would become progressively more involved in the China area, perhaps necessitating a further postponement of the Honshu operation. The second course of action, reliance upon bombing alone, General MacArthur considered to be capable of accomplishment with a minimum loss of life, but at the risk of prolonging the war indefinitely. It would fail to utilise our resources for amphibious offensive movement, assumes success of air power alone to conquer a people in spite of its demonstrated failure in Europe, where Germany was subject to more intensive bombardment than can be brought to bear against Japan, and where all the available resources in ground troops of the United States, the United Kingdom and Russia had to be committed in order to force a decision. The third course, involving assaults directly against Kyushu and Honshu, had several strong arguments in its favour and was analysed by General MacArthur as follows. It would attain neutralisation by establishing air power at the closest practicable distance from the final objective in the Japanese islands, would permit application of a full power of our combined resources, ground, naval and air on the decisive objective, would deter an attack against an area which probably will be more lightly defended this year than next, would continue the offensive methods which had been so successful in Pacific campaigns, would place maximum pressure of our combined forces upon the enemy, which might well force his surrender earlier than anticipated, and would place us in the best favourable position for delivery of the decisive assault early in 1946. Our attack would have to be launched with a lesser degree of neutralisation, and with a shorter period of time for preparation. Examination of the advantages and disadvantages of the various courses of possible action, 
General MacArthur concluded that the last of these outlined strategies was clearly the preferable plan. Unless there was insufficient supporting air power available, or the resources in the Pacific could not be gathered in time to initiate the assault by 1945, he advocated the immediate adoption of this last course. General MacArthur had little doubt that sufficient power to overcome Japanese resistance could be massed in the fall of 1945 for an invasion of Kyushu. He stated his reasons as follows. I am of the opinion that the ground, naval, air and logistic resources in the Pacific are adequate to carry out Course 3. The Japanese fleet has been reduced to practical impotence. The Japanese Air Force has been reduced to a line of action which involves uncoordinated suicidal attacks against our forces, employing all types of planes, including trainers. Their attrition is heavy, and their power for sustained action is diminishing rapidly. These conditions will be accentuated after the establishment of our air forces in the Ryukyus. With the increase in the tempo of long-range attacks, the enemy's ability to provide replacement planes will diminish, and the Japanese potential will decline at an increasing rate. It is believed that the development of air bases in the Ryukyus, in conjunction with carrier-based planes, will give us sufficient air power to support landings on Kyushu, ensuring complete air supremacy over Honshu. Logistic considerations present the most difficult problem. From the standpoint of weather, which was a determinative factor in any plan for operations against Japan, General MacArthur thought the Kyushu assault should be made in November rather than December, and suggested that the tentative date for Olympic, previously adopted by the Joint Chiefs of Staff, be moved forward by one month. Admiral Nimitz, while suggesting several modifications in the general strategy, was in full agreement with General MacArthur's opinion that the invasion of Kyushu should be effected at the earliest date. He concurred in the selection of the 1st of November as the date to launch the invasion. In a series of conferences at Manila in mid-May, General MacArthur's and Admiral Nimitz's planning staffs formulated the broad principles to be incorporated into the plan for downfall and submitted their conclusions to Washington. On the 25th of May, the Joint Chiefs of Staff issued the directive for the Olympic operation against Kyushu, setting the target date for the 1st of November 1945. Under this directive, General MacArthur was given primary responsibility for conducting the entire operation, including control of the amphibious assault through the appropriate naval commander. He was also directed to plan and prepare for the continuation of the campaign in Japan, and to cooperate with Admiral Nimitz in formulating its amphibious phases. Admiral Nimitz was tasked with carrying out the naval and amphibious phases of Olympic. The land campaign was to be prioritised in all preparations for the Kyushu assault. The concept of downfall visualised Japan's surrender through two successive operations. First, to advance Allied land-based air forces into southern Kyushu to support the second, a knockout blow to the enemy's heart in the Tokyo area. These operations would continue until all organised resistance in the Japanese home islands was ended. When the plans for downfall were drawn in April 1945, assumptions were made about Allied and enemy capabilities. It was assumed that the Pacific's entire resources would be at the disposal of General MacArthur and Admiral Nimitz, that US Army forces would be redeployed to the Pacific after Germany's surrender, and that base establishments, staging facilities and heavy cargo shipping would be available for continued support. By the start of the assault, US forces would be established on the Bonin's Ryukyus line. Land-based planes were expected to have air superiority over southern Kyushu, and the US Pacific Fleet, operating from forward naval bases, would dominate the waters east of Japan. The Japanese were expected to defend with their full strength, including opposition from organised military forces and fierce resistance from the civilian population. The Japanese Navy was considered a minor threat, as its fleet remnants would likely withdraw to the Yellow Sea or the Western Japan Sea. Massed kamikaze attacks from the remaining Japanese air forces were expected to pose the most effective opposition to the Kyushu assault, though it was hoped that continued Allied bombardments would reduce the severity of these attacks. With the final loss of Okinawa in late June and the large-scale air raids over their main cities, 
it became increasingly evident that Japan was in desperate straits and that the time was fast approaching when the war would be waged on their own islands. Before any extensive defence measures could be put into effect, the Japanese High Command had to formulate a concrete estimate of Allied intentions. Only by an accurate assessment of the timing and strategy projected in United States plans, and by a correct disposition of their own strength, could Japan's military leaders hope to upset or repel an invasion of the mainland. Opinions within the Imperial General Headquarters differed on the question of impending Allied operations. The various views fell into two main categories, one maintaining that the United States would initiate a long-range programme of intensified blockade and strategic air bombardment to destroy Japan's combat potential completely, while the other considered that the war would be brought to a decisive stage by an immediate amphibious invasion of Japan proper. Although these two possibilities were injected into all discussions on strategy, they were not given equal prominence. The majority of Japan's military planners adhered consistently to the latter view, that an Allied invasion in force would be launched as soon as the necessary men and ships could be massed. In order to carry out definite defence measures, a decision as to which course of action to prepare for became necessary. By the 1st of July 1945, Imperial General Headquarters adopted the official position that the United States would seek a quick end to the war, by an all-out ground force invasion coupled with intensified sea and air operations. It was assumed that new forward bases for air and naval action would be seized in the northern Ryukyus, the Izu Islands, and possibly Quelpart Island. After these preliminary moves, the Japanese expected strong amphibious assaults against the southern part of Japan proper. Tanega Island, Osumi Peninsula, and other strategic areas in South Kyushu and along the southern coast of Shikoku, were named as the most likely targets to be occupied by Allied forces. The possibility of a diversionary feint at Hokkaido to cover the main landings was also taken into account. In general, the time of the southern Japan operations was placed in the fall of 1945, and the date of the decisive Kanto Plain operation in the spring of 1946. The date of invasion, the Japanese thought, would depend to a large degree upon the number of troops and the amount of shipping the United States considered necessary for large-scale successful landings. It was calculated that by the fall of 1945, the United States would be able to mount a total of 30 divisions for amphibious operations against the homeland, and that a cumulative total of 50 divisions could be massed by the spring of 1946. The general conclusion drawn in the Japanese estimate of Allied capabilities in July 1945 was that the United States was mustering enormous and overwhelming military strength for use against Japan and that the Great Battle would be joined between early fall of 1945 and spring of 1946. Kyushu, the southernmost of Japan's four main islands, extends about 200 miles from north to south and has a general width of about 80 to 120 miles from east to west. More than three quarters of its territory consists of mountainous terrain, with a few plain lands scattered along the coasts. The road network running across the island was limited and in poor condition. The Kokudo or National Highway was a euphemism for a single-loop, two-lane gravel road, badly torn by the heavy military traffic in constant flow over its surface. The highway was built along the island's coast, running down the west to Kushikino, cutting across to Kagoshima, along the north bay to Miyakonojo, then north and east to Miyazaki, and finally up the east coast. The inland prefectural roads were, for the most part, one and a half lanes wide, interspersed with frequent passing locations and suitable for light transport only. The remaining roads were narrow, primitive, one-way dirt tracks, virtually impassable in wet weather. The main railroad line paralleled the route of the highway and consisted of a single track system with numerous bridges and tunnels that could be easily and quickly blocked when necessary. In the cultivated lowlands, the roads were built on fills rising four to five feet above the surrounding ground, making bypassing and detouring extremely difficult. In the mountains, both the roads and railroads were channeled through many cuts any of which could be sealed to prevent hostile passage. 
The entire transportation network was subject to complete disruption to prevent movement by attacker and defender alike. The American plan for the invasion of Kyushu contemplated the seizure of only the southern part of the island below a line drawn from Tsuno on the east coast to Sendai on the west. The 3,000 square miles thus marked off were deemed sufficient to provide the air bases necessary for short-range support of the final operations planned against the industrial centres of Honshu. In this southern portion selected for invasion under the Olympic plan, there were four lowland areas suitable for the development of major airfields. One of these extended from Kagoshima, on the western shore of the bay bearing the same name, through a narrow corridor to the Kushikino Plain on the East China Sea. A second ran northward from Shibushi on Ariake Bay, through a twisting valley to Miyakonojo. The third started at Kanoya, east of Kagoshima Bay, and followed along the coast of Ariake Bay. The fourth and largest was located north of Miyazaki on the east coast. To acquire these valuable areas in the shortest possible time, the initial assaults were to be directed towards securing Kagoshima and Ariake Bays as ports of entry. The inland advance would then be extended as far as the Suno Sendai line to block mountain defiles and prevent enemy reinforcements from the north. The southern Kyushu landings were to take place in November 1945 under cover of one of the heaviest neutralization bombardments by naval and air forces ever carried out in the Pacific. From bases in the Marianas and the Ryukyus, the 20th Air Force would attempt to seal the source of Japan's industrial potential by striking ruthlessly at her factories and transportation system. The steady pounding by the huge B-29 bombers, increasing in tempo and fury with each passing day, was expected to reduce Japan's ability to maintain her large military organisation intact or to distribute her remaining power effectively. Simultaneously, Carrier task forces would carry out repeated raids against vital coastal areas, attacking enemy naval and air forces, disrupting communications on shore and at sea, and aiding the long-range bombers in attacks against strategic targets. The Far East Air Force, based in the Ryukyus, would concentrate on selected objectives calculated to destroy Japan's air arms, both in the homeland and in nearby North China and Korea. By intercepting shipping and shattering communications, the Far East Air Force would complete the isolation of southern Kyushu and prepare it for amphibious assault. It was intended that these air raids be intensified with the approach of the target date, culminating in an all-out effort from X-10 to X-Day. These last ten days before the landing phase would see the massed bombing power of all available planes, both land and carrier-based, directed in a mighty assault to reduce the enemy's defences, destroy his remaining air forces, isolate the objective area, and cover the preliminary minesweeping and naval bombardment operations. The fortifications within the selected landing areas would be smothered under tons of explosives, while naval vessels and engineer units moved in to eliminate underwater mines and barriers. Supported by such overwhelming and concentrated power, it was expected that the amphibious forces would be able to stage the assault landings without unreasonable losses. To conduct the preliminary operations of clearing the routes of approach to the landing beaches, seizing emergency anchorages and initiating the shore bombardment, an advanced attack force would be launched from the Philippines to arrive off Kyushu on X-4. Strong air cover would be furnished to this advance force, the main attack force would proceed from the four key Pacific bases, Hawaii, the Marianas, the Philippines and the Ryukyus, and, protected by the US Pacific Fleet and a solid air umbrella, would converge on southern Kyushu by X day for a three-pronged landing in the Miyazaki area on the east, at Ariake Bay on the south and at Kushikino on the west. Two main deception efforts were planned, one strategic and the other tactical. To encourage the belief that Allied attention was focused primarily on the Asiatic coast and the Chusan Archipelago, the China Theatre Command and the Southeast Asia Command would conduct diversionary ground movements in China and the Malay Peninsula. The tactical diversionary effort would be made by a fainting blow against the island of Shikoku. A floating reserve of two divisions, a part of the main attack force, would appear off eastern Shikoku from X2 to X-Day, and then, after its deceptive mission was performed, 
would proceed to the Ryukyus to be available for reinforcement call. After the beachheads were safely established, reserve and service troops would be brought forward, land-based aviation installed progressively, and logistic facilities developed. Military government would be instituted as soon as practicable after the objective areas were consolidated. Since the Joint Chiefs of Staff Directive of the 3rd of April 1945 was based on the premise that forces from Europe would not be available in time for Olympic, General MacArthur's plan for the employment of his ground forces involved primarily those combat troops already within the theatre. The assault on Kyushu was assigned to the veteran 6th Army under General Kruger. The advance attack force, and given the mission of seizing positions in the Koshiki Island Group, located off Kyushu's southwest coast, opposite Sendai. The division was expected to establish emergency naval and seaplane bases in these islands and clear the sea routes to the coastal invasion area of Kushikino. The 40th Division was also given the mission of making preliminary landings in the four islands of Tanega, Make, Take and Iwo, off the southern tip of Kyushu. These islands would be occupied to safeguard the subsequent passage of friendly shipping through the strategic Osumi Strait dot on X day. Three corps would effect simultaneous assault landings in the three objective areas. V Marine Amphibious Corps, 3rd, 4th and 5th Marine Divisions, would go ashore in the vicinity of Kushikino, drive eastward to secure the western shore of Kagoshima Bay, and then turn north to block the movement of enemy reinforcements from Upper Kyushu. Satsun Corps, 1st Cavalry, Americal and 43rd Divisions, would land at Ariaki Bay, capture Kanoya, advance to the eastern shore of Kagoshima Bay, and then move northwestward to Miyakonojo. I Corps, 25th, 33rd and 41st Divisions, would make its assault at Miyazaki on the east coast, move southwestward to occupy Miyakonojo, and clear the northern shore of Kagoshima Bay to protect the northeast flank. Corps, 81st and 98th Divisions, initially in the 6th Army Reserve afloat, was selected to carry out the diversionary threat off the island of Shikoku, while the other three assault forces moved on the actual landing beaches. Should these four corps prove insufficient to accomplish the tasks assigned, a build-up from the elements earmarked for coronet would be instituted at the rate of three divisions per month beginning about X plus 30. The coronet operation would be adjusted accordingly. If deemed advisable, General MacArthur would have the reserve elements conduct an amphibious assault near Wakiura on the southern coast as soon as adequate naval support could be assured. The primary aim of all operations was to secure areas suitable for the immediate construction of air bases and to clear Kagoshima Bay for use as a port and naval base. Once these objectives were accomplished, General Kruger would consolidate the area south of the Tsuno Sendai Line and prepare to stage four divisions and other forces to aid in the execution of Coronet. Under the Olympic plan, General MacArthur was responsible for the logistic support of all army forces engaged in the assault operation, including Marine Corps units under his command. Admiral Nimitz had similar responsibilities for maintaining all naval forces and was also to furnish the organisational equipment and supplies necessary for the Marine Corps passing to army control. The 20th Air Force would handle its own logistics. Manila was designated as the base to provide the initial supply for troops being staged in the Western Pacific, while Hawaii would serve the same function for troops sent from the Middle Pacific. Resupply and the bulk of construction materials would come directly from the United States, augmented as necessary from Pacific bases. AFWESPAC was made responsible for organising Army Service Command Olympic to provide logistic support within the Kyushu combat zone. The Philippines, Ryukyus, Marianas and Hawaii were the four Pacific bases chosen to stage, equip and mount the invasion forces. Naval shipping would carry the assault and reinforcing elements forward from the mounting areas and transport the heavy equipment and stores. Following the successful completion of the assault phase, the Kyushu ports of Kagoshima and Shibushi would be developed as soon as possible to support further penetration inland and to the north. Local resources and civilian labour would be maximised to speed the Allied advance. 
A key problem confronting General MacArthur before every operation was the question of enemy dispositions and capabilities in the projected invasion area. The following extracts from the intelligence estimate prepared for Olympic provide an excellent illustration of the comprehensive preparation and staff work that preceded a major military campaign. By the end of July, General MacArthur had a fairly complete picture of what to expect when his forces invaded Kyushu. To keep this picture up to date, new information was filled in as it was received from various intelligence sources. 1. Estimate of the enemy situation. A. Development of ground strength. 1. Initial estimates on Kyushu from the 24th of March and the 25th of April 1945 anticipated an initial enemy deployment of six divisions, but seriously forecast a potentially larger deployment of ten divisions. Although the Japanese obviously regard the Tokyo Plain as the ultimate decisive battleground, it is apparent that Kyushu is considered a critical sector in their planned empire battle position. It is believed that plans will visualise the assignment of about six combat divisions, plus two depot divisions, to garrison Kyushu initially, and that they are prepared to expend up to ten divisions, all they can tactically employ in the area to ensure its retention. Depot facilities to maintain such a force would have been established in northern Kyushu. Underscore. These divisions have since made their appearance, as predicted, and the end is not in sight. This threatening development will affect our own troop basis and calls for special air missions. If this deployment is not checked, it may grow to a point where we attack at a ratio of one to one, which is not the recipe for victory. B. Development of command structure. Recent information suggests the grouping of mobile combat units under two core headquarters, one in southern and one in northern Kyushu. However, it is possible that with the considerable increase in strength in southern Kyushu, a third corps may eventually be formed. 57 corps established headquarters at Takarabe, Miyakonojo Basin, during the period of April-June 1945, believed responsible for the defence of southern Kyushu, that is, the area south of the central mountain mass. 56 Corps, headquarters established at Izuka, east of Fukuoka, in June 1945, probably responsible for the defence of the area north of the central mountain mass. C. Organisation of Volunteer Defence Units Information received since the G2 estimate of 24 April 1945 indicates that the Japanese have accelerated their mobilisation programme, now augmenting army and navy units with large numbers of volunteer home defence units, composed largely of partially trained reservists, in addition to regular troops. It is estimated that approximately 125,000 of these are available in southern Kyushu, and approximately 450,000 in northern Kyushu. The recent assignment of major generals as commanders of 26 of the 51 regimental recruiting districts in Japan, formerly commanded by colonels, indicates a possible reorganisation into divisions or even corps. It is significant that these new commanders have had recent frontline field commands. The appearance of new divisions numbered in the 200S and 300S whereas the highest previously identified division number was 161, supports this theory. d. Tactical significance of defiles. 1. The rapid Japanese concentration in southern Kyushu is likely influenced by the full-capacity use of two overland roads and railroad routes from northern to southern Kyushu. Some of the incoming units may have arrived by sea, but it is probable that three, Four divisions activated by depots in northern Kyushu and southwest Honshu utilised the overland routes. The Japanese, aware of the vulnerability of these supply lines, have initiated special anti-aircraft defence measures. 2. Blocking critical defiles, such as bridges, tunnels and rail lines, through concentrated aerial bombing or naval bombardment, would severely hinder Japanese reinforcements and supplies from northern Kyushu. 2. Conclusions. A. The rate of Japanese reinforcements into Kyushu is changing the tactical situation significantly. Additional major units will likely enter the area before the target date. B. Japanese preparations to defend southern Kyushu are accelerating. C. 
Their land and sea routes are vulnerable, and disruption of these would strain their efforts to supply and reinforce their troops. D. Enemy strength in southern Kyushu has grown from approximately 80,000 troops to an estimated 206,000, including seven divisions. Major interruptions to their supply lines would seriously weaken their preparations. It is apparent that massing in present attack vectors is occurring. Unless the use of these routes is restricted by air and or naval action, as suggested in paragraphs 1E4 and 2A2, C and D of the G2, estimate of April 25th, enemy forces in southern Kyushu may be further augmented. This could overcome our planned local superiority, giving the Japanese complete freedom of action in organising the area and completing their preparations for defence. Increasing air raids by American bombers against southern Kyushu and Shikoku in June 1945 gave the Japanese another reason to believe these areas would be the focal point for the initial invasion of the homeland. Accordingly, Imperial General Headquarters hastened operational preparations and prioritised transporting and accumulating supplies to support the newly organised ground forces in southern Japan. Shifting the emphasis of defence to Kyushu necessitated postponing military preparations in the Tokyo-Yokohama area. The Japanese feared that if the Kanto region were invaded soon after the Kyushu attack, or if Honshu were assaulted directly, they would be unable to mount an adequate defence, as most of their air and naval power would already be committed to Kyushu. For this reason, Imperial General Headquarters were reluctant to transfer ground strength from the capital area until the very last moment. Although air and sea preparations were pushed in Kyushu, and supplies and munitions were moved southward, the Japanese delayed committing troops to the area pending further developments. They correctly assumed that the United States' first objective would be to annihilate Japanese forces on the southern Kyushu front and occupy strategic air bases and harbours in Miyazaki and Kagoshima prefectures. After the invasion of Tanegashima, where a fighter base was expected to be installed, it was probable that American forces would direct their main attack against the Shibushi area on the Ariake Bay front and the Sumiyoshi coast on the Miyazaki plain. A secondary attack was expected on Fukuyajahama on the Satsuma peninsula. Since these areas were geographically isolated from each other, it was believed that the Americans would seek to divide and contain the Japanese units. The Japanese estimated that the first attack would be on the Miyazaki Plain or the Satsuma Peninsula, or both. The main force of the assault would likely be directed at Ariake Bay, while other elements would attempt to break through the mouth of Kagoshima Bay. Simultaneously, an airborne landing might be made on airfields around Kanoya and Miyakonojo. It was also thought probable that the Tosa Plain of southern Shikoku would be invaded to destroy the launch sites of Japanese special attack planes and establish American fighter bases. The Japanese expected the United States to employ about 15 divisions, with 10 to 12 divisions attacking southern Kyushu. Two divisions were anticipated to commit to Shikoku, with the rest held in reserve. The initial landing force, expected to be strong enough to defeat a Japanese counterattack, would probably comprise at least three divisions in the main sector and about two divisions on other fronts. To counter the US invasion of southern Kyushu, the Japanese planned to attack the landing force on the sea and in coastal landing areas, using all available air strength in the region. Reconnaissance was to be conducted around the clock within a 600-mile radius by 40 naval reconnaissance planes, supported by Army air reconnaissance elements. Secret airfields were to be used by kamikaze special attack units to escape bombing raids. The air fleet of 10,500 planes, mostly small special attack types, was to be expended within 10 days in a supreme effort to repel the invasion. By the end of June 1945, 8,000 planes were already available, with the remaining 2,500 expected by fall. The Japanese Navy, with little remaining power, relied on small special attack craft and a few hidden heavy surface units. The 1st and 8th were to launch a decisive amphibious operation in the Kanto Plain, aiming to occupy the Tokyo-Yokohama area. 
General MacArthur was to command the landing forces and direct operations on the mainland. The initial landings were planned with ten reinforced infantry divisions, three marine divisions and two armoured divisions. These forces, launched from bases in the Philippines and Central Pacific, were to be protected by ships and planes. Reinforcements, including airborne divisions and a reserve corps, were to follow within 30 days to ensure the capture of the Kanto Plain and surrounding regions. Strategic reserves would consist of divisions in the Philippines and the United States, which could reinforce at a rate of four per month. The amphibious assault on Honshu was to be preceded by heavy air and naval bombardments to cripple Japanese communications and defences. Subsidiary actions in other theatres were designed to contain Japanese forces. Naval and air forces based in the Aleutians would be called upon to lend general support wherever possible. All plans were directed toward the successful execution of the greatest amphibious operation ever planned. The decisive operation in the projected campaign to bring about the final collapse of Japan was the invasion of Honshu, plate number 122. The total defeat of Japan's armies in the core of the empire was the overall primary objective. In the event that the campaign in the Kanto Plain did not prove to be the last battle, the secondary objective would be to secure positions from which to continue air, ground and amphibious operations in the main islands of Japan. The choice of the Kanto Plain for the final campaign in the Japanese homeland had several distinct advantages. Firstly, that area offered a wide choice of suitable landing beaches, a cardinal consideration in any amphibious operation, plate number 123. As the largest lowland region in the Japanese home islands, the Kanto Plain would enable the Allies to capitalise readily on their superiority in mechanisation and armour. Logistic requirements to support the large forces involved necessitated good port facilities. The western shores of Tokyo Bay offered the best in Japan. In addition, the Kanto area served as the political and communications centre for the Japanese Empire, containing approximately 50% of Japan's war industry. Geographically, the Kanto Plain extends approximately 80 miles north and south, and 70 miles east and west covering between 5,000 and 6,000 square miles. The north and west sides are bordered by the mountainous masses of central and northern Honshu, which rise sharply to heights of 1,000, 8,000 feet. Its eastern side is bounded by the Pacific Ocean, and its southern side is bordered by the waters of Tokyo and Sagami Bays. The outer reaches of the plain have three principal landing areas, each fronted with long sandy beaches, generally well suited to amphibious operations. These are the Kashima and Kujukuri beaches on the east coast and Sagami Beach at the head of Sagami Bay. From each of these landing points, fairly good routes lead into the Kanto Plain. Landings made in other regions would require overland movements through narrow, easily defended corridors. The capital of Tokyo is the hub of a widespread network of roads and railroads radiating outward along the Kanto Plain to northern, western and southwestern Honshu. Numerous transverse roads and railroads within the plain provide good routes of travel to or from Tokyo. Although these routes were important factors to the Japanese in reinforcement potential, they were relatively vulnerable to air attack. The destruction or blockade of the exposed bridges, tunnels and defiles would seriously disrupt the transportation system and impede commercial and industrial activities. Additionally, due to the widespread electrification of the railroads, effective bombing of dams, hydroelectric plants and power stations would be catastrophic to the operation of the rail transport system. The American landings on Honshu were to strike along the centre of the east coast, the forces of the 8th Army under General Eichelberger would constitute a Western attack force to seize beachheads at the top of Sagami Bay, plate number 124. From their initial positions, these troops would fan out to the north and east, taking the western shores of Tokyo Bay as far north as Yokohama. The armoured elements would drive beyond Tokyo to the Kumagaya-Koga area to cut off Japanese reinforcement routes. If necessary, General Eichelberger would turn back his armour to strike at Tokyo from the rear. At the same time, other units under his command would complete the seizure of Yokohama. 
the veteran First Army of General Courtney H. Hodges, redeployed to the Pacific from the battlefields of Europe, would strike at the Kujukuri beaches about 50 miles east of Tokyo, provide protection for the northeastern flank, and then strike out to the west and south to clear the eastern shores of Tokyo and Sagami Bays. One spearhead would advance directly toward Tokyo to destroy all hostile forces there in preparation for the establishment of air, naval and supply facilities in the vicinity of the Japanese capital. Only American troops would be engaged initially in central Honshu, but plans were made for the use of Australian, Canadian, British and French divisions in subsequent stages of the campaign. They would be employed in case Japanese resistance should continue, even after the heart of their homeland was in American hands. By mid-June 1945, Japanese plans for the vital campaign in Honshu envisioned an all-out battle on the main beaches leading to the Kanto Plain. Kashima Nada, Kujukuri Hama and the head of Sagami Bay were regarded as the crucial areas to be held at all costs against an amphibious invasion. Of the three beaches, Kujukuri Hama was selected as the area where the prime initial effort of the Japanese forces would be concentrated. The general strategy called for the coastal combat divisions to send their entire resources against the American assault head-on, with the underlying objective of merging all lines into an interlocking and continuously fluid struggle in which American air, artillery and naval gunfire would be seriously hampered in their choice of targets. It was felt that this was the only possible way to neutralise the tremendous air and sea superiority of the Allies. Regular line combat divisions in prepared defences would take up the fight alongside and in the immediate rear of the coastal combat troops. Other forces would reinforce the area of initial contact as fast as they could be moved into position. Without waiting to mass their strength, they would plunge immediately into the battle lines to be committed on a narrow front in great depth against a thin Allied beachhead. Japanese strategy was directed toward giving the landing forces no respite or opportunity to gain a firm foothold. It was not planned to keep any sizable reserves in the central Kanto Plain region. If the Japanese could not hold the beaches and prevent a landing of heavy weapons and equipment, they felt that their last hope of a successful defence of Honshu would be irretrievably lost. The total ground combat strength in the general Kanto Plain region, including the shorelines of the three key areas, consisted of 18 infantry divisions, seven independent mixed brigades, two armoured divisions and three tank brigades. Of the infantry divisions, 11 were line combat, while the other seven were made up of the specially organised coastal combat troops. In addition, a force of division strength was organised to make a last-ditch stand in the heart of the city of Tokyo and around the Imperial Palace. No definite provisions were made for the employment of air power in the event Honshu was assaulted in the spring of 1946, since it was anticipated that the Kyushu campaign would have consumed Japan's entire remaining air force, Special attack surface craft were to be utilised to the fullest extent, 